Hey, what's going on everyone? I'm back again with another video. This time I'm actually going to be doing a movie review, and I haven't done that in quite some time. It's been over a year, but you know what? I figured I'd get back on that hat, on that horse, get some confidence, and get back in that, in that groove. And why not start off with The Good Bane, and start off with a very underrated cult classic, which actually has a bit of horror, thriller, and action rolled into one. And it's the 1986 film The Hitcher. And it says here, never pick up strangers. Indeed, you shouldn't. And um, right off the bat, I really do enjoy the hell of this movie. It's a very, un it's a very effective, unnerving movie, and it just really takes you on a ride. And you know, it does it does have you know, but kind of borrow the uh, the aspect of Duel, which came out actually back in 1971. It takes a little bit of that influence and kind of expands on it it kind of you actually see the killer here and basically the plot of this movie involves um our two character two main characters played by Roger Howard and C. Thomas Howe as uh, John Ryder and Jim Halsley respectively it involves basically C. Thomas Howe character basically escaping the clutches of a murderous hitchhiker and eventually despite escaping them he's going to be eventually stalked by the hitchhiker and he eventually gets framed for his crimes he eventually kind of has to fight for survival and fight to clear his name and also possibly track him and probably kill him which is in fact what the hitchhiker wants him to do and in diving right into the to the crew and cast the film itself was directed by robert harman he would go on to do several other films uh, he did uh, Eyes of an Angel with John Travolta after this. Then he would go on to do a, a film with Jean-Claude Van Damme called Nowhere to Run. I remember seeing that film. I remember not minding it, but it's been a while. But he would also do a film called Gotti, which had Armand Asante in it. Then he did some kind of historical drama film with Jeff Daniels. <clears throat> and then right after that, he actually did another horror film called They, which was actually executive produced by Wes Craven. Then he did another kind of he did another film that was similar to this film here, and I actually re reviewed it on the channel a couple years ago called Highwayman. I thought that was actually a solid film. And I think that's the last film that, uh, the last horror film that Robert Harmon did, because the next film he did was actually a film with Tom Selleck called Something About D-Day, and then pretty much for the rest of his career, Harmon worked with Tom Selleck on the, on the Jesse Stone films, and the last film, of course, he directed was the Jesse Stone film back in 2015, and haven't seen anything since. Or he hasn't directed anything since then, I don't think. And then the film itself was the writer was Eric Red. He would go on to do the next one we did after this was Near Dark, a vampire film. I hear it's pretty good, but I haven't seen it. But I do know it has Bill Paxton in it and Jenny Wright from uh, Out of Bounds. And then he would do Conan and Tate after that. And then he would go on to do another horror film. Actually, no, sorry, he did Conan Tate. Then he actually wrote Blue Steel, which I happen to like with Jamie Lee Curtis. He would go on to do Body Parts after that. Um, a very solid underrated horror film with Jeff Fahey. If it's seen, if it's if you haven't seen it, check it out. I really do enjoy it. I might do a review of that at some point if I feel up to it. Then he did a couple of films that came out in '96. One was like a TV film with um, Lou Diamond Phillips, Mia Sara, and I believe Charles Dance. I forget what it was called. I never saw it. But he did the other film that I actually liked. Uh, another horror film called Bad Moon. A, a very very solid underrated werewolf film done on a modest budget and I and didn't do very well either most of the films that Eric Red did didn't do well and this film technically didn't do well either unfortunately and then in 2000 he actually was involved in a very controversial car wreck which I won't get into then he resurfaced in 2008 with a film called 100 feet and I remember not not minding it it was actually an okay film just had issues with the ending it had Famica Johnson who played Jean Grey in the X-Men films and of course you know she was a villain in the, in the GoldenEye film then he did some other TV film after that but I don't know what it, I haven't seen it and that's pretty much all Eric Red has done at that point and then I'm gonna mention the cinematographer his name is John Seal he did a, a wonderful job photographing this film and I'll definitely talk about the cinematography of this movie and then I'm also going to mention the composer Mark Isham he scored the film I he did a great job on this film as well he's scored hundreds of films I know one of them would be Point Break which would, which would technically be 30 years old he did the first Blade film uh, he's done so many other films I know he did a recent Liam Neeson film but 
he scored so many films. I know he did Crash and some other no. He did so many other familiar films I can't really think of. But yeah, diving right into this movie, um, what I really like about this is just the psycho the psych psychological mind play between Rugger Howard's character and C. Thomas Howe, and just the the dialogue between them, especially you know John Ryder's dialogue when you first encounter him. He's he's rather evasive and brooding, and just really he's just really weird, and you know something's definitely off with this character, and then. After uh, after some questions are asked about a, a particular uh, car off the side of the road, and him asking what do you want, his uh, rider just laughs at it. And he says, "That's what the guy said," and he's like, and then they keep asking questions like, you know, the guy he said the guy picked him up and he was so that was him I saw. And he's like, yeah, he didn't walk very far, and then of course Halsley, you know is asking how's that and then Howard says some very chilling lines and he says because I cut off his legs his arms and his head and I'm gonna do the same thing to you just the way Howard delivers that line is just chilling and unnerving and and I'm just gonna say this Rugger Howard is definitely the best part of this movie he he is very intense in his performance. He really is just that, un he's just that unnerving, intimidating, and you can say creepy, but that's just really an understatement. He, his character is just, just pretty fucking vicious, and he plays it to a fucking T. He plays it so well that it's no surprise that Rucker Howard is good at playing villains like this. He's, he's played villains before, and I um, heard he was a good, good villain in Nighthawks. I think it was called Nighthawk. Or Nighthawks, I can't remember. It was a film with Sylvester Stallone, and then he did, he played another villain in Blade Runner. I don't know if he played a villain in Flesh and Blood. I can't remember that, but um, but he also can play some good guy roles. Like before this, he did Lady Hawk. He also, and right after this, he did the film Wanted Dead or Alive, which I think is a very underrated Roger Howard film. He played a good guy in Blind Fury, and I believe he also played another good guy in. Uh, what was it called? Split second, and I've yet to see that film, but I hear it's really good. But yeah, Howard, he he definitely owns this role. He definitely relishes in this role. It was a role he want he definitely wanted to play because he actually didn't want to play you know bad guys, but he felt like this was the this was an opportunity of a lifetime to play this character. Originally, at one point, they were hoping that actors like uh, oh gosh, Terrence Stamp, Sam El and Sam Elliott, they were the ones that were that were narrowed down stamped in when it refused and passed on it they couldn't agree on a fee for uh for sam elliott and other actors that were considered were maybe uh sam shepherd and i can't remember who else but and for the c thomas Howell role there was matthew modine tom cruise and Emilio estevez but i think they definitely settled on i think it was good that they settled on c thomas Howell because i think he played the rather vulnerable and innocent type of teenager pretty well as he starts off as being very afraid of Howard and in fact see Thomas Howe was pretty afraid of Howard in real life especially right after that scene that I mentioned there was a later there was a scene not too, not too long after where Howard's talking to has the switchblade and he's talking about how how, an eye, how it's, what's it like to have an eyeball being punctured or how the blood whenever somebody's throat is being slit so yeah he's just the way he's holding the knife towards C. Thomas's Howe character, that's just a very um, nerve-wracking and just and just just very intense. That's that's what that's really what Howard Brand brings to this role. He really shows it. And then whenever uh, he, C. Thomas's Howe actually has that moment where he actually sees that how that uh, Ryder's not even wearing a seatbelt and the door wasn't even closed, he's actually able to shove him out. And he has that little brief moment of victory. He's like, yeah, ah, yeah, fuck you, buddy. Which I think C. Thomas Howe did very well. But then, believe it or not, the hitcher reappears out of nowhere. He actually appears in another vehicle, except this is actually a family. You, you, you have a husband and wife. You have, you actually, I think you have two kids in that vehicle. And C. Thomas Howe actually tries to, in fact, warn them. But they're not able to understand them. And eventually... 
you know, he kind of has a brief little scuffle with the bus, and then eventually he does come to find the family in that station wagon. But even though you don't see it, you can tell you can find, you see blood, and you, they they've all been brutally murdered, and you realize that that Towers' character, John Ryder, is somebody not to be messed with, and this guy means business, and he needs to be stopped for good. And um, eventually, we it gets led on to where we interact with. Uh, Jennifer Jason Leigh's character, Nash, who eventually befriends him, and um, it definitely comes he definitely comes to his aid, especially when he learns to you know the fact that he's innocent. Which now I think is a bit of a flaw in itself, but I'll get to that. And there's actually and there's of course moments where you know during the time where he's interacting with Nash, he's having he's eating his dinner, and then eventually he actually almost eats a severed finger to shows you how dangerous uh, John Ryder is and even before then there's actually a moment at the gas station where um, he actually you know has somehow has tracked Jim Halsley and he actually lights up the there's actually fuel on the ground and Ryder lights a match up and burns the fucking gas station and even before then there's actually an interesting little scene where you know where he thinks he's escaped excuse me, the hitcher, and he actually interacts with them is, like, during this, this, I think it's probably a dust storm, and they're almost face to, they're almost close to each other, he actually tosses him the keys, like, you know, since he was able to evade John Ryder earlier, it's, like, almost like a challenge in a way, like, hey, this is your chance, you, you can try and stop me if you can, and they kind of, and you, you kind of wonder if maybe the, the hitcher is kind of maybe trying to maybe build him up or because you know the hitcher wants to die and he basically sees Jim Halsey as the chance f for him to kill him pretty much like maybe he's trying to make a man out of him in fact there's actually a later scene where you know after Halsey escapes the cops because apparently John Ryder has actually killed him they actually cap they actually captured Halsey at one point but he apparently Ryder kills him all and he actually leaves the, the jail cell open for him and there's a scene where uh, Halsey and Howard's character is in some kind of gas station, and it looks like maybe Halsey has a chance to blow him away. But then Ryder looks looks down. He's like the gun's empty, and then apparently uh, he Halsey's not believing him. Actually, believes he's gonna. He's, he tries to shoot him, and he and and Ryder pretends like he has a gun. And he just and he goes boom. And then Halsey, Halsey tries to shoot, but there's of course no bullets. And Halsey questions why is he doing this to him. And then Ryder just puts two pennies on his eyes, and he says, "You're a smart kid. Why don't you figure it out?" And he actually gives him bullets eventually later for the gun. And there's actually a scene where there's some good action sequences where apparently when Halsey's trying to surrender, he actually holds a couple cops hostage. And then when he's trying to talk to the captain, played by Jeffrey Dumoon, who eventually will come into play in, in the third act, right when he was about to surrender, out of nowhere, John Ryder shows up, guns down the two cops, and there's a moment where Halsey is maybe contemplating suicide at one point, but he's able to regain his composure. He eventually is able to try, get on the bus and interacts with Nash, tells him you know, that it wasn't him that has been committing these murders, because of course you know he's been framed for this. And eventually, when the cops, when one of the cops actually tries to kill Hosley, Nash decides to intervene and help out. And they're eventually being chased down by the other cops. They actually are, in fact, trying to kill them. There's a nice little chase scene was there where apparently, right when the cops are about to, you know, shoot at them, Halsley, Halsley breaks on the police vehicle that they were in, and the two, the two car, the two car cops, they actually shoot each other's tires out, and they actually flip over, and it causes significantly. It causes significant crash and damage to the vehicle. They probably didn't survive, and they and Jim and Nash continue to drive down the road. But then the helicopter comes out of nowhere, starts shooting at them, and then yet again, Ryder comes out of nowhere and actually guns down the helicopter with a pistol. The very good, surprisingly good action sequence. So, like I said, um, I like this, like the psychological mind play between Jim Halsley and John Ryder. They definitely what makes this film, but also the action sequences for what they are, they're done pretty well and with the not a very high budget. The film was almost six. They only they spent like almost six million, like 
5.8 million technically, but they used to, that budget to the potential, and for them to actually have sequences like that where a helicopter comes crashing down, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty well done for a film back in '86. And um, not only that, what I meant to also say was the cinematography by John Steele. It's wonderful. I mean, even in the very beginning when it's at night, they really capture that you know that that the landscape and the just the the physical geography of of pretty much you know the entire uh, you know the road and the mountains that you see the, the landscape it's just very well shot especially during the day it's very very beautiful and they really captured that that kind of Texas and I believe they shot in California and, and I think Arizona they managed to really capture those sta those states landscapes pretty well and even you know just the exterior shots of you know you know the, of the diner that where Nash works at and the you know the bus and the gas stations they really capture certain small small towns very well it's just very well shot and, and they did a good job or he did it or sorry John Seal did a very good job on capturing that look and kind of the, and especially during that scene where we see John and and sorry John and Jim you know when they're in this one little abandoned kind of garage looking setting and there's like a probably a dust storm and the wind's blowing very well shot and very well lit you know this is very well done and I can, I can go on and on but the cinematography is just top notch in this movie and not only that the score by Mark Isham very eerie score but very very emotional especially during the moments where you know he's not being attacked by the hitcher and you know he's trying to figure out his you know what to do in, in, in this crisis um just the vulnerability of Jim, how his character really grows from being vulnerable to, you know, being put through the reiner, and then by the end, spoilers. If you don't want to, if you want to, if you don't want to watch, don't watch this further. But if you want to continue watching, go ahead. But when he definitely confronts the hitcher, and there was a moment, in the moment where uh, John Ryder actually kidnaps Nash, ties her up, and he has her, the rope attached to the truck that he's that he's in and if he lets off in that gas pedal it's gonna rip her to shreds and there's and that's when Jeffrey Del Moon's character comes in and they to you know try to get Jim Halsey to at least see if he can at least help and get Na or maybe get him to free Nash because if they try rescuing her he, he'll he'll um, he'll step off the pedal and she'll die and if they sh even if they shoot him he'll she'll die so basically they're in a no-win situation and and Halsey you know he definitely grabs the gun that Jim, that John hands him and asks him to put it to his forehead, but he's not able to do it, and he ends up being very disappointed, saying pathetic and weak, and eventually he lets off the gas pedal, and Nash actually dies in the film, so kind of sucks for that, for that character, since he was really, really the innocent one, but after that, that's when Jim Halsey becomes very determined to go after him and actually kill him, and of course we see this, the interrogation with uh, our men, Shimmer men, and the course they actually don't know who <laughs> they tried looking they can't even find him in the identification re records that so that just tells you how much of a you know just probably a ghost that he is they, they never really reveal a backstory about him so anywho getting to the climax he eventually you know Halsey ends up stealing uh, um, the, uh, Jeffrey Newman's character's gun and that tells him to get out so he goes after the after the after John and they they engage in this little battle where actually John actually has actually escaped the you know the handcuffs he's actually shot all the officers dead jumps into the car he, there's even a moment where he says hi kid and they actually Halsey steps on the brakes gets thrown out but yet John Ryder's still alive he's actually shooting at the vehicle even though he's actually intentionally missing him he just he wants to get it over with you know he's that determined to you know die. And eventually, C. Thomas' how character is able to get the truck started. He actually hits him with the vehicle. And when you just when you think that maybe, you know, that really did him in, it still doesn't. He actually, he's physically wounded, but he actually stands up, gets, he actually throws the handcuffs, and actually Halsey turns around and shoot, shoots him three times with a shotgun. And um, that's pretty much it. And then you see that, that other, that really wonderful shot by the cinematographer where you see the silhouette of, excuse me, my eyes, of Jim saying, you know, next to that vehicle, the credits rolling, 
in the sunset. It's like I said, this movie's very beautifully shot. There's no question about it. But um, yeah, um, I have no way else. I well, I guess the flaw is, I find it very odd that Nash was able to kind of believe him in that. You know, believe Halsey wasn't, you know, responsible for it. It's kind of kind of weird how quickly he she believed him. I guess that's one of the flaws. But other than that, this film. It takes you on a roller coaster. There's no doubt about this. This film is well acted, well shot, and well scored. That you would think this would have done well at the box office, but Sally, this movie did not do very well at the box office. <clears throat> but it would go, go, go on to have a very good cult following, and it became one of Howard's recognized films after that. It, it's probably his most, his best acted film, and same with C. Thomas Howell. Excuse me. And he would, they would make a sequel, but the sequel was not very good from what I've read. And there was that shitty remake from what I heard. So other than that, I really can't say anything bad, bad about this film. I, I just think, you know, if you haven't seen it, give it a watch. You can, you can actually see it for free on YouTube if you just type in The Hitcher 1986. You'll be able to see a 720, 720p copy. And speaking of this, the Blu-ray here, here, the Blu-ray, the presentation is nice. It does capture the. I liked how they were able to. How we can see the cinematography, the the Texas and California and probably Arizona landscapes. The physical geography, you know, stands out. But the problem was with this Blu-ray, is that there is a doc, supposedly there was a documentary and there was trailers on here, but Sally, it will not play on here, and that's very disappointing. That's kind of the reason why I got it, and of course, you know, to get the the actual physical copy because I really do enjoy this movie, and it'd be nice if. If it does get an official release, like maybe Scream Factory or Kino Lobo gets a hold of this and they can do a 4K or 2K remaster of some kind, it would be nice to get this remastered. But Anywho, so in other words, I definitely would recommend this film. If you haven't seen it, give it a shot. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. And Howard, you know, and C. Thomas Howell, they're the, they're the, def they're the definitely bright spots in this film, bar none. Uh, they're just the story acting cinematography I feel like I'm repeating myself but it's very well done it doesn't disappoint it's I don't I don't this movie did not deserve to be remade and if there if there if it was if there was a better sequel it should have gotten a much better one which I won't get into but kudos to the cast and the crew they did an excellent job in such a very limited budget of six million I think they just the, the just the thrill of it just the just the roller coaster ride that you, that you know Jim Halsey goes through and takes this on it's just hard to it's really hard to it's, it's kind of really hard to repeat itself it's really hard to uh, say that the I'm kind of at a loss for words. I think, I think y'all should definitely give it a watch. You definitely won't be disappointed. And I don't know what else to say. I think I'm gonna just end it right here. You know, give it a shot. You won't be disappointed. So yeah, that's my review for the Hitcher. Uh, feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Um, all that jazz. And yeah, it's been a long, it's been a good while since I did a review. But hey. You know, it's pretty late, I'm a bit tired, and I'm hoping that I, I at least was coherent and everything, but I'm kind of out of it, so there you go. Hopefully you all enjoyed this review, and I guess we'll call it good. Okay, we'll see you later, folks. Bye-bye.